Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We have a worldwide concern about the status of shark populations. When you see that number of sharks and biomass removed from the ocean, it's very problematic. We have a lot of trails. <laughs> big Bend Ranch State Park is a very big place and there is a whole lot of opportunities. Yeehaw! I love wildlife and I know that we have the ability to have tremendous impact in these urban environments. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. Shark! Big shark! Big shark! These biologists have nicknamed this massive tiger shark Sam Houston, and he's being caught for science. Washer. They are attaching a tracking transmitter, all in an effort to help save the species. Sharks play very, very important roles in our marine ecosystem. Uh, without having these top-end, what we call apex predators, you have the ecosystem that gets out of balance. Um, these predators help control everything below them. And now these wolves of the ocean are in trouble. Worldwide, sharks have been depleted by overfishing. Between 30 and 70 million sharks killed by humans every year. What impact that has, we simply don't know because we don't have a firm understanding of really even how many sharks are out there. Catching sharks for their fins is a billion dollar a year business. One of the things that has contributed to a decline in sharks was uh, shark finning. Fishermen who actually catch the sharks and, and cut their fins off and discard the body. Since 1993, that practice has been illegal in American waters, but it still continues in, in foreign waters because they can get you know up to $900 a pound for the shark fins. As Asia, and in particular China's economy, thrives, the demand for extravagant shark fin soup has exploded, and there are few international fishing regulations in place. We have a worldwide concern about the status of shark populations. When you see that number of sharks and biomass removed from the ocean, it's very problematic. And that's where the science really comes in, is what does the true abundance of these sharks look like? Texas Parks and Wildlife biologists keep a close eye on sharks every summer by doing what's called a long line study. This morning we're going to the Gulf of Mexico and our, uh, our target is to catch as many sharks as we can and just tag as many sharks as we can. The bait that we use is Atlantic mackerel. It's a really oily fish, and uh, the sharks seem to like it. Good job. We're setting the line right now. The line comes out off of the spool, and as we're going, we have these hooks in these barrels. We we'll pull those out of the barrel and just clip them onto the line as we go. We use these long lines to help us monitor the distribution and abundance of sharks within the Gulf of Mexico. Yep. Oh, 
Definitely an adrenaline rush. Uh, that's that's one where, reason I'm on the back of the boat. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's uh, pretty exciting when you get to jump on top of a shark and you feel that pulse about when they're about to just freak out. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Mail. There you go. Good tag. I need a link. 1444. I need a weight. 164. Whoa. whoa. All right, just let it go, let it go, let it go. The sharks that we catch, we also tag and release. We go ahead and lay it over the side, like that. So we get information on their movements and their growth rates. And we can use all that information to help manage and conserve shark species. A major scientific concern we have with shark populations in Texas are understanding their migration patterns. Uh, understanding where they go and when can be essential towards their proper management. So now, Sam Houston and many more sharks have been tagged by scientists from the Heart Research Institute. We have literally 50 or more sharks tagged. Um, they're swimming around, reporting back, and telling us all types of scientific information. And it turns out that information is a bit troubling. In general, we see a southward movement into Mexico. And that movement pattern concerns us somewhat, given that there's large gill net fleets as well as longline fleets that are in operation in those waters. And that is the most immediate threat here on the Texas coast. Unbelievable amount of sharks, anywhere between two and 3,000. We've got Mexican commercial fishermen that come into U.S. waters the most common type of species that is being caught on this illegal gear are sharks. So throughout the year, game wardens head for the coastal border. You know when you can read that name, Mary. I'm going to try to read it as well. Checking on compliant fishermen is easy. Captain, you all seen any other traffic besides yourselves out here in this area? But spotting an illegal net or long line in this immense ocean, now that's a struggle. It, it's definitely, uh, it weighs on me because it, it is a large amount of water that I'm trying to cover with this one vessel. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And you have to keep your eyes peeled day and night. Here's the main line right here. We're about uh, half a mile north of the Mexican border and about two and a half miles offshore. Big black drum. These lines like this, they're undiscriminating. They'll catch anything. It'll take that bait. It's going to get caught on those circle hooks. These lines could be as long as four and five miles long. Shark. Go shark. Go ahead, pull it up. Sorry. And he should be just fine. He was still very much alive. And that's it. We've probably picked up a mile and a half, maybe two miles of line. This is what we're out here to do is, is to protect this resource. Got tell, got tell. Right. Through protection, awareness, 16 4. and conservation, there is hope for these wolves of the ocean. Besides having inherent value as living creatures, they're vitally important in helping maintain the balance in the ecosystems in which they live. Hammer, 1870. Good tag. So it's incredibly important that we do all we can to protect them. The future of our shark populations literally hangs in the balance of what we do today. It's very important that we properly manage these species and understand them scientifically so they're sustainable for future generations. Now, as far as Sam Houston goes, that tiger shark is alive and well as he continues to provide crucial data. As for all the other sharks in these waters, 
It's up to us to make sure they are still here tomorrow. This is an overwhelming experience when you come out here for the first time. You just really feel as if you're on the edge of the earth. There's no other place like it in Texas. I'm a, the fitness writer for the Austin American Statesman. I'm working on a story for my column about uh, what it's like to mountain bike in Big Bend Ranch State Park. Ready to go? Ready to go. Let's go. Do it. I'm a little nervous, <laughs> I guess. It's jagged and rough and just seems wild west to me. But it's beautiful too. The whole route, we're doing 108 miles over four days and camping out at night. Big Bend Ranch State Park is the biggest state park that we have in the state of Texas. It's 310,000 acres and about 388 miles of road, trail, route. We have a lot of trails. <laughs> Big Bend Ranch State Park is a very big place, and there is a whole lot of opportunities. Yeehaw! Sweet, guys, look at the view of that Chisos in front of you. It is challenging in places. It's smooth in places. This is awesome. What I love about Big Bend Ranch is it has a little bit of everything. <laughs> oh, look at that. You got it. <laughs> about a mile and a half left. Getting out on a mountain bike just lets you cover more ground. It's about all there is to do out here. If you don't like the outdoor stuff, you might as well go back to the city. on a mountain bike, you don't have to go but 100 yards and you can probably find something that's pretty technical. Some of those spots on our main road are kind of challenging. There's parts where I walk and, you know, I hike my bike and it's okay to do that. Whoa! Oh! You okay? I think so. I'm gonna go do it again. Okay, good idea. We survived our first day on the trail. It was very challenging. Can I get a toe from here? Now I feel pleasantly pooped out, and I'm going to sleep well tonight, I know. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. A lot of people would think it would be crazy to come bike in the desert, but it's very magical to me. Check out the view. I think in the next three to five years, this will be the mountain biking mecca of Texas, if not the southwestern United States. It's very, very beautiful. Prickly stuff and tarantulas everywhere. <laughs> this is kind of like what I pictured Texas to be when I was a little kid. Another day in paradise. It's just nice to see that there's still wide open spaces. This state and the world in general is becoming more and more urban. Typically when I tell people I'm an urban wildlife biologist, they say things like, do you study rats and cockroaches? There's a misconception that cities are not the place for wildlife, and it's just not true. I think it's a great surprise to most people that there is such a position as an urban wildlife biologist. Urban wildlife biologists are kind of like the animals here in the city. 
We're highly adaptable and we take advantage of any opportunity that comes along. Think of Texas wildlife and you might not think of Houston, Dallas, or El Paso, but spending a day with the biologists who work here might change your mind. Part of our job as an urban biologist is to help urban residents understand the wildlife that's living all around them. Right down there. Makes it more stable with the heavy side down. On a June morning there you go. in there eastern you go. El Paso, urban biologist Lois Ballin works with a volunteer crew to dig and dig a hole in the desert. Let's give it our first try, guys. We're going to be a little okay, off on this one. Though it looks like some up. strange plumbing project. What's very, very important here is that it all goes downhill. They're actually building a house from, from here to there. for a family it up. of owls. We're making an artificial nest burrow for burrowing owls. But, yeah, yeah, further in. This is an urban wildlife sanctuary park, Rio Bosque Wetlands, and it's a, a place that we can provide more habitat for the owls. Burrowing owls need this housing assistance because more and more people are calling El Paso home. There's a lot of construction going on and a lot of owls being displaced. So as fast as folks can build these artificial burrows, I think we got it now. Grateful owls are moving in. There will be a mama bird here in, in less than a week. Every one of these that we put in gets a no vacancy sign in five days. I believe that's good. Let's just cover the heck out of it. Where are we going for breakfast? <laughs> On the other side of the city, Lois meets with the president of a local land trust, helping wildlife in a different way. And we peeled them in here on the edge of the canyon. We've lost so much native habitat. Wrestler Arroyo was a very important site to preserve. So I was surprised to find so many barrel cacti right here in the middle of town. Right, right. This is an established neighborhood. It's been here since the 50s. And people really got used to the idea of Wrestler Canyon always being there for them to enjoy in its natural state. This desert habitat was scheduled to become a subdivision of over 100 homes until a generous neighbor funded its preservation. Dr. Teschner donated basically his entire inheritance to the land trust so that we could buy Wrestler Canyon and preserve it forever. And we now manage it as a nature preserve. Look at the desert willow in bloom. Oh. Lois advises That's the great. land trust in managing this and other conserved areas. It's an invaluable resource to have her expertise working together to preserve a special place. You never know what's going to happen on a certain day. I, saw the lion. I got a call about a mountain lion yeah. in central El Paso. We definitely have mountain lions. We've even had black bear come through El Paso. So that's why I go to investigate. And it's close to a high school. We got neighbors that have kids. You know, it's kind of scary to see a mountain lion roaming around. Nothing I it was gone. Lois gets the details of the sighting and, with local game wardens, searches for evidence. I'm going to look for tracks. Okay. But the rocky soil yields no clues. We didn't find any physical evidence. We're always looking for proof so we can go to the next level if we need to. As cities grow, people may threaten wildlife or feel threatened by wildlife. Urban biologists work to prevent negative encounters with nature and promote positive ones, even in the state's largest city. In 2005, the City of Houston Parks Department realized that there was an opportunity for bat viewing at Wad Drive Bridge here in Houston. We didn't know anything about the bat colony that was here. We knew there were Mexican free-tail bats, but we didn't know much about them. Enter the yeah, bat yeah, team. They're towards the end there. I organized a group of volunteers called the Houston Bat Team. We came down and started monitoring the bat population, just making general it's observations. Full, it's full all the way. The volunteers collect environmental data at the bridge, estimate the numbers of bats that call it home, and help the public better understand bats. It's just packed. See, look how full it is. Wow. All the way. 
Isn't that neat? That's neat. There's 250,000 to 300,000 bats that are in the bridge. We think some do migrate, but there are some that stay. Are they starting to do it? And here they come. So we can have bat viewing year round here in Houston, which is pretty cool when you think about a nature tourism opportunity. This is a Mexican free tail bat. They eat two and a half tons of insects every night. So do you think they're beneficial to us? Yeah. Oh yeah, big time. People come down to the bridge to get a better view, to get more information. See them coming out? And hopefully that same information helps change attitudes toward bats. An urban species that they're living right next to is actually a beneficial species as well. When we have a nuisance wildlife situation, you can inevitably tie it back to humans misbehaving. We try to get people not to feed urban wildlife species. Inevitably, that becomes a problem. Hello, is this Peggy? When John Davis this speaks John to Davis folks in the Dallas wildlife. area, he stresses the best way to provide for wildlife is to landscape with native plants. Can anyone name the native species in this photograph? It always cracks me up when someone says, the McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> the grackle is the answer. <laughs> there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. <laughs> Grackles absolutely love Bradford pears. How many of you want more grackles in the city? Anybody? So my point being, we're actually creating some of these very problems that we would like to get rid of, and by planting native plants, we can offset some of that. Growing native plants is catching on in some surprising places. Tierra Verde is a very, very unusual golf course. From the very beginning, they were designing with wildlife habitat in it looks mind. Looks like a mature golf ball, even though it's pretty good. Tierra Verde Golf Course is the first municipal golf course in the world to achieve Audubon International Signature Certification. What they tried to do when they built the golf course is preserve uh, native habitat and corridors all over the facility for wildlife to go throughout the property. And the design doesn't just benefit urban wildlife. We don't have to use as much water. We don't have to use as much man hours to mow, no pesticides. And uh, that's great for us on an economic sense. We keep a master list of, of all the species on the golf course. The biggest thing about the golf course is all the nature that's here. It just makes it an enjoyable round to come out and play. And John is always happy to offer some guidance when he can help. This is looking really nice. The urban biologists are, are such a resource for us. Some broom sedge blue stem mixed in down there. Mm -hmm. We have to find ways to develop while still being able to keep wildlife habitat around. And I believe Tierra Verde is a really good example of doing that. What kind of lizards are they? It's lizard. The main focus is to make people aware of habitat and wildlife so that they will want to help protect it. Very good. Nice. Every day in any urban area, we lose green space where urban wildlife could be. We can live in harmony if we try, and it's just a matter of learning how to make that happen. Humans are the ones that make decisions about what happens to wildlife and wildlife habitat in this state. And so I feel very, very passionately about the importance of, of the jobs that we're doing in these urban environments. I love my job.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.